When it comes to great British racing cars, there are a few names that come to mind. Aston Martin, McLaren, Lotus, and of course, Jaguar. And when you think of what may be the greatest Jaguar race car of all time, it's hard to deny that this car isn't at the top of that list. This is a 1956 Jaguar D-Type and it was built with one goal in mind, to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And it did just that, taking home a three-win streak at Le Mans from 1955 to 1957. However, it wasn't just Le Mans that the D-Type found itself in the winner's circle. Over its racing career, whether from works or privateer racing, drivers would bring home wins at the 12 Hours of Sebring and the 12 Hours of Reims while piloting this incredible Jaguar. During their initial production, Jaguar built somewhere between 71 and 75 total D-types, which were either factory or privateer race cars, as well as a small run of street legal production cars called the XKSS. In recent years, Jaguar has produced a small number of continuation D-types, however, getting your hands on an original like this one is no easy task. Most original D-types will trade in the $5 to $10 million range, with prized race history examples fetching up to $22 million at auction. With their small production figures and incredibly high price, D-types are a rare sight to see, but incredibly worth it if you can find one in person. This one is chassis XKD538, and it is owned and permanently displayed by the Simeo Museum in Philadelphia, who have been gracious enough to let me spend the day with it. If you want to see this D-Type and the greatest collection of sports cars ever assembled, be sure to check them out. The D-Type was built upon a foundation set by the legendary C-Type and sought to further its development into an even greater sports car. Rather than using the tube frame setup of the C-Type, Jaguar developed its first monocoque chassis for the D-Type, with bolt-on subframes to allow for easier disassembly. It's powered by a 3.4 liter straight six engine producing 250 horsepower and utilizes a dry sump oil system. In 1956, this wasn't quite enough power to compete against Ferrari's Colombo V12s or Mercedes W196s. However, Jaguar made up for having lower power figures than the competition in more ways than one. The first of these advantages was disc brakes. Today, they're used by nearly every high-end sports car and race car out there, but this wasn't always the case. In the mid-1950s, Jaguar was the only manufacturer who was able to put disc brakes on their race cars due to a partnership with Dunlop, who had developed the technology to be used in road cars. This advantage considerably increased the average speed of Jaguar's race cars in endurance races due to their ability to brake at later times and therefore sustain higher speeds throughout the race. However, it wasn't just stopping power that made the D-Type faster. Looking at the car, you'll immediately notice just how sleek and aerodynamic its body is. Made from aluminum alloy, the D-Type's body was handcrafted to be as low and drag reducing as possible on the almost four mile long Mulzahn Strait, where it would reach speeds over 170 miles per hour. Everything on the D-Type's body is curved and made to flow through the air as it barreled down the infamous straight at Le Mans. The D-Type even has this removable piece of bodywork to cover the passenger seat area in perfectly fitted headlight covers in order to reduce drag and continue the uninterrupted flow of air over and around the car. Its aerodynamic design is an incredible mix of both beauty and functionality that was highlighted in race cars during this period. Now, because of this, getting inside the D-Type is a bit tricky since there's no visible door handle or an obvious way in and out of the car, so here's how you do it. If you reach over the body and into the cabin, you'll find a small metal handle inside the pocket of the door. Lift that up and the latch will release to open it for you. Now, the door isn't held open with hydraulics or straps, so it's best to hand it off to someone to hold it open for you while you get inside if you can. Next, take a big step over the threshold of the car and try to get your leg past the steering wheel. To support yourself as you climb in, place your hand on the transmission tunnel and the back of the seat as you don't want to put pressure on the body since the aluminum can dent very easily. Finally, once you're over the threshold, lift your other leg into the cabin, lower yourself down into the seat, and congrats, you're now sitting inside a Jaguar D-Type. Once you're inside, you'll see the car is wrapped around you like a cocoon so that you're as unobstructing to its aerodynamics as possible. You sit very low inside the car and the driver's compartment has a short wraparound windshield to deflect airflow around you, with a small rear view mirror mounted outside of it. In front of you is a three-spoke steering wheel that's been drilled out for weight savings, and weirdly enough, the emblem at the center of it is the only spot I could find on the car that actually says Jaguar. Looking at the gauges, on your left you have a speedometer that goes to 180 miles per hour and a tachometer that maxes out at 8,000 RPM. Then, over on your right you have your readouts for oil pressure, water temp, battery voltage, and your fuel. It really is an honor to get to sit in a car this historic and valuable, and as much as I'd like to, sadly, I did not get the green light to drive the D-Type today, but I was told we could give it a start up and film a few drive-bys, so let's see your fire up.
I hope you enjoyed this video, so be sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.